How does creating the life of your dreams in 2016 sound? Or what about helping someone else do the same? With Christmas approaching, the well and new range of inspirational products is all inspiring. Choose from vision board kits, a gratitude box, a John box, coaching packages, and more. Gifts start from just $5. To find out more, simply go to wellandyou.com. That's W-E-L-L-I-N-E-U-X.com. And click on the Christmas catalog to help make 2016 incredible for you and the people you care about. TheWellnessCouch.com, streaming wellness into your lives. Welcome to Nourishing the Mother, featuring your hosts, Bridget Wood and Julie Tenner. Hello and welcome to Nourishing the Mother. I'm Bridget Wood. And I'm Julie Tenner. And today's podcast is Who Are You After Babies? And it comes about via a question that we received via email, which was, how do you know when you're done having kids? Or how do you know that and where do you move on from there? So we thought probably the way around that is really to tap into, well, what does that feel like? How do you know? And beyond that, what are you after you're outside of that really, I'm going to say infancy phase where it's so intense Mm. and you've got so much going on and toddlers and it's all about nappies and playing and cleaning up and And sleep and getting sleep and how much are they sleeping? How much are you sleeping? All that stuff. Yes. The intensity of it all that has you kind of feeling like to some extent you've lost who you are. You've become such a creature of service Mm. that it's who's left at the end of all of that and now what do I do with all of these feelings and perhaps this new woman that I've become or these new tolerances or viewpoints that I've received through that process and how does that all fit into where where's my life going Mm. yeah and I guess a a good way to probably kick that off is to really ask you because I mean Julie you're done and did you know (laughs) I'm done (laughs) you're done you're done (laughs) (laughs) but you know I hear of women say when they have their last baby that they just knew that they were finished. I know. I so, so deeply. I know it sounds like it was when Bridget and I were talking about this topic. I'm like, well, that's not a half hour podcast, Bridget. When you're done, you're just done. (laughs) There's there's no more to it. (laughs) You're going, really? (laughs) There's not, there's not a topic in that. And the truth of it is it's true. You know, when I had my my first two really close together, so it was only 18 months between my first two. And then I have nearly seven years age gap between my middle and my youngest. So that's, you know, massive. Mm. But that comes about with, right, we had the two kids. I've said this before. I'd gotten through all of that and they were in kindergarten and my career had started up again, which felt like it had been, um, I don't know, freeze frozen for a period of time. Mm. And I was really just starting to get back those pieces of the woman that I was or am or want to be Mm. and more independence, more space, more connection with my husband because the kids took up less of that intensity of my personal space, I suppose. But the truth of it is at the bottom of all of that was this deep um, yearning of I so desperately wanted another baby. Like I so desperately just knew there was another soul there Mm. that I wanted to experience and I wanted so desperately to experience pregnancy and do it the way I wanted to again and breastfeeding and I mean I love newborn babies Mm. and you know co-sleeping and I was like oh I just yum I just want that Mm. but the rational part of my head and my husband kicked in right and we're like well that doesn't make any sense because here's all the reasons that that's not an economically viable decision to make (laughs) and I was like yes okay I can move with that and I, I did years of mourning the future that I had in my head and trying to disown that part of me that really desperately wanted it feeling like it was wrong or not the right time or not Mm. okay and what I kept coming back to was you never regret having another child Mm. but you can spend a whole life in regret for not having had that child yeah yeah and then as I said you know we had the um, pregnancy that resulted in the miscarriage and that was that you know moment of alignment where we both got totally on board having another baby Mm. But as soon as I had Lola, that yearning, that that kind of deep driving, overriding of my uh, rational brain just disappeared, Mm. disappeared. And it was such a um, quiet, grounded contentment that each time I moved through a phase, so when I said goodbye to 
I don't know, co-sleeping or wrapping or breastfeeding or, you know, previously I would mourn that or I'd try and hang on to it a bit longer because yeah, I wasn't ready to give it up. And... and this time I was like, oh, thanks. I feel such gratitude for having done that, but I'm really happy just to leave you there yeah. and move here. Yeah. And it was a total, com- complete, total seated in my power, calm. Mm. That was awesome, but happy to leave that there. I wonder how many other mums um, have that certainty as they move through those phases or if there's that part of them that sort of thinks, oh, maybe again. Yeah, well, I'd, I think that's the thing though, right? Like yeah. start, we talk about this to some of the mums at school and some of them have still three or four kids and they're in there at 40s. And they're like, if I wasn't in my 40s, I'd have another child for sure. Mm. But they're still living with that yearning. Yeah, yeah. Which for me was torture. Mm. Like that seven years of not having another baby was torture. Like at the bottom of all of that, that it was a driving sensation within my being mm. that I felt tortured by wow. <laughs> because it was in such a disconnect with, with my rational brain. Yeah. With, with what you, with the vision that you had for the right way to do things yeah. and natural progression. Yeah. 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 Um, so how do you know when you're done having kids I don't know. Maybe that's a complicated answer. Maybe it's not as simple as done because sometimes you can't just be done. You don't have the luxury of being done, Mm. right? Maybe sometimes that's, that's the reality is our bodies, our circumstances. I don't know. Our life phases or the choices that we choose that still serve us in some ways don't allow that yearning to disappear maybe, Mm. or maybe that yearning creates, I don't know, a career path or a maternal instinct that expands beyond, I don't know, like now that I'm saying it, maybe done isn't done. I don't know. And I think also, you know, it's just changing form. So you might be done in the nurturing of a baby, but you just change, you shift that energy. So that energy can now give way to perhaps creating a business that you love or creating a special friendship group or relationships or a learning path. You know, it's, yeah. it might just be that you're shifting that energy into some other area. It's not really gone. It's just changing changing the way that it looks in your life. Yeah. Because, you know, so many women, it's, I hear of friends of mine who um, they might be perhaps disconnected with their partner and sort of not kind of going there too much in terms of sex and things, but yet they've got these businesses that are just, they're so dynamic at and all their energy is going into that. And they're actually almost directing their sexual energy into creating a yeah. business because it's that's creation too. That's yeah. it's a direction of energy, and we can choose to direct that wherever we want, and where and wherever we choose is different for every person based on what they value most. Yes, and the same the same goes for I guess mothering. Like, is it going to be into your children solely, or is it going to be into something else? Can you do both? I was actually just reading a book last night um, about Janine Ellis who founded Boost Juice Bars. Mm. And she um, has got four children and, you know, she did motherhood in a way that would challenge so many people in that she kind of grew her business with her kids running around under her feet and, you know, her, everything went into her business. And fortunately, her mother really took on that hands-on kind of full-time nanny role while she was building this business. And, you know, that her kids got what they needed, but it might not have necessarily been from her. It was from their grandmother. And, you know... I guess it comes back to who are we to say what's the right way to do that because they will have got a richness from in the connection with their grandmother and also the lessons from their mother on what it takes to do what you love as well and and accept that things look different for every person. It was funny before the podcast I was chatting to Julie about that idea of you know what's right and what's wrong in the context of knowing when you're done and knowing what's for you and what's not and it's this idea of you know when you're feeling really proud and self-righteous about your parenting and you're kicking goals you really want there to be a right way to do parenting and then when you're having a really shitty day and you've yelled too much and you're just feeling bad about it you don't want there to be a wrong way (laughs) which I really love hey because it's so true you know we we kind of want a gold gold star when we're like you know Got kids are all in bed and they've had the most amazing day and you've been chilled out, chilled out and you haven't yelled once. You're like, I deserve, you know, a big glass of wine after this day versus those other days where, you know, you're like, don't look at me. <laughs> you've just had enough. Yeah. And I love that. But yeah, that's kind of off topic. Thinking about babies and being done, I'm so not done. And I knew the minute that I had Hugo that I wasn't done. I was never going to be done at one. 
But I also didn't think that I'd be, I'd have an almost three year old and not be, not have another one mm. either. You know, I had, I couldn't have envisaged when I had a little baby that I would have a business that I'm directly directing so much attention to and that I'd be learn, spending so much time learning um, all this stuff around human behavior and consciousness that I'm learning. So we can't always know the form that things are going to take either, you know, and the way that we're going to want to direct, direct our energy. Um, but yeah, I'm not done. Do you have that yearning feeling? I don't even know that it's yearning because it's not a desperation, mm. you know, um, I just have a sense that I know it's going to happen. And, and I, and I'm not particularly attached to exactly when, um, which I think is kind of, I feel comfortable in that. I feel like there's a freedom in that as opposed to, um, that trying to will something to happen and that sense of that it's something's eluding me because I think that there's a desperation that comes with that that can sometimes mean that it eludes you further mm. um you know whereas I don't really have that sense at the moment yeah fair enough mm. so if we're thinking about beyond the concept of being done who are you as a woman after babies do you, do you feel a bit lost about who you were during your time with Hugo yeah, I mean, when he was three months old, I took up a course on magazine writing, actually. <laughs> yeah, because I really didn't know who I was as a mother, you know. Like, and, and in fact, perhaps that's why I spent so much time intellectualizing parenting and wanting to understand the right way to do things, in inverted commas, to really almost make him or make my role as a mother a project, which is interesting. Because I love to learn and, and I would... And, and so in my motherhood, that was a way to learn and grow more, but that I almost got almost lost in that process as well. I think like looking back, it's been an enormous like letting go of the layers of, you know, self and also the layers of subordinating to, to authorities that I thought were right. But I certainly, um, yeah, I, I've kind of, I don't know, it's been a funny journey. I always say to people, I've grown more in the last two years than I have in the last 10. And I think like motherhood offers up so much to find ourselves through, but also conversely lose yourself in Yeah. when you give so much of yourself to that role and try and define yourself by, you how know. How good a mother you are. Yeah, how good a mother you are. And, yeah. and you know, and it is so intense. I think that you're so cut off. It's so I, motherhood can be entirely isolating. If you're spending all day at home or you don't have a circle of friends that have young children mm. or it's too hard to go to the shops and it's, you know, you're too exhausted to go to the park, you can find yourself spending all day in a house on your own with your children. Feeling like the four walls are closing in on you. Yeah. Well, just the whole isolating concept. And then you add, you know, days upon days upon years of mm. service to others with you getting the scrap. I mean, it's the whole point of nourishing the mother, right? Because most women get the scraps of care that are left over as opposed yeah. to their care being a priority in themselves, being mm. a priority from which to serve others that you get to the other end of that and you go, I completely lost who I am. And I don't even remember. I can't even recognize the woman that I was mm. Five years ago, partying on that dance floor, who is, where is she? That mm. woman who was spicy and sassy and loved her body and, you know, had, was funny. Where has she gone? Mm. Because she's lost in, I don't know, track pants and vomit and a thousand pooey nappies. Like, <laughs> when- and I think that's a particularly pertinent point when the kids are so little, you know, and the demands on you are so great. Yeah, they really are. You know, unless you're going to work and you've got them in care and you can kind of, you know put on some half respectable clothes and know that they're going to stay clean all day and that you get eight hours. Yeah, it's think. true. It's you know, true. Because that, that is a different dynamic. Yeah, it is true. Yeah, it's true. If I think about when I was lecturing and my kids were little, mm-hmm. work was a break. Yeah. Yeah. And, but then again, conversely, you come home and you want a break from work, but there's no break from work because you're then yes. second you're shift, working. right? Yeah, it's, yeah, it's a second. totally. And, you know, they talked about that in the seventies, all the feminist writers, the second shift. You know, the, woman, the, the the man will work all day and go home and relax. The wife will work all day, go home and be a mother for three hours until the children are in bed and then she'll clean the house. Yeah. And then maybe she'll go to bed. You know, like yes. that, that's a kind of... And I think, you know, we're, we're becoming more balanced um, as we 
grow as a society and those roles are a lot, a lot more interchangeable. But it's but the service, service, service. It's, so it's it, it a is. loss of self and loss of identity yes. within that because you're constantly giving out in the care and service of others yeah. as opposed to the care and service of, of, yourself. of yourself, which is what I think we define ourselves as women as pre-kids as we spend so much time uh, defining and serving ourselves. We mm. might have a partner, but it still revolves around today. I feel like having a bath today. I feel like putting makeup on mm. today. I really need to go and have breakfast with my girlfriend. It's still about serving and nourishing that woman. Yes. But but when you, your whole world becomes about the service and nourishing of others, you lose who mm. that woman is. Mm. And if, if, you know, that's the thing with being a seductress, isn't it? Is that it requires a constant vigilance. Pleasure requires a constant vigilance. It's a mm. conscience, constant checking in and uh, tally. And sometimes you're going to be drained a bit more. And sometimes you're going to need to put in a little bit more. And sometimes that flow is going to be even. But it's, it's never just you're good at it or you're bad at it or you've got all the tools. Because it's a constant process of mm. moving and evolving the putting in and the taking out and that act of service becomes itself so when you have lost the identity of who you are and all of the things you used to do that would serve and nourish who you are no longer are happening in your life you feel I think a bit of a, a I don't know a shell sometimes mm. I can totally remember that feeling of saying particularly after my third child and you've gone through so many sh personal and emotional shifts that you also don't want to be the woman you were or you don't view the world the way that yeah. she did. Yeah. I was like, I can't fit in where I was there. I can't mm. do that job and I can't – so I can't be her – but I don't know who I am and where the fuck am I going in the future? Like what do you what do we what do you do with all of this learning and changing? And it's almost like the sand's been blown up and you've got to wait for that dust to settle mm. before it settles and who you are and where you're headed, right? Mm, totally. And so for me it all comes back to service. So I I speak to so many women who almost have that midlife crisis because we're all having babies mostly around middle ish age by the time we're finished having babies, mm. right? Mm. And it is almost in, in perfect coinciding with that third of the way through our lifetime that, you know, midlife there's something very poignant about, you know, 33 to 40, those sort of age years, I think. Mm. And women also, I think, hit their sexual awakening peak. So it is almost like the perfect storm that it's yeah. all kind of happened at the one time. And so for me, when I think about who are you after you've had babies, well, that's what nourishing the mother is for. It's how do you put back the pieces and build the woman that you are are in service of the woman you were but also in service to the woman you're becoming mm -hmm. and that was the whole purpose of nourishing the mother right was we enough of this giving out of service to everybody and you having the scraps that are left over you've got to have space to find yourself in the in the storm of all of that happening because when you are solid and knowing and loving and appreciating of who you are that is what filters out mm. and you also then are able to balance better I think that balance of divine mother with divine seductress slash purpose in my life work career yeah. woman on her own outside of being a mother mm. I think so for the woman who I suppose feels like yeah that's all fair and well in theory but how the hell do I do it yeah let's tackle that because I think that we can theorize around those concepts but really it's about well how do I access that how do I you know because for so many mothers it's like okay well I've got the lunches to sort out I've got my yeah. kids activities to sort yeah. out I've got a husband who needs me to you know organize him where the hell yep. do I carve out the space for me how do I make that happen with the relationships that I've currently got around me Yes. So it's about, okay, so number one is how do you carve out time? Because mm. yes, there's things you can do during your day and we'll touch on that, but it's also about you actually seriously have to have time on your own, in your own space and your own energy and your own head mm. to carve out who you are. So how do you carve that time of self-care out for yourself mm -hmm. out of your schedule that already feels immensely full? Now you and I have spent a lot of time on this and you and I both choose to get up early in the morning. Yeah, we get up really early. Most so mornings. <laughs> most mornings, so I'm up at five thirty, and either most well, not every morning, but most mornings, and I'm either swimming, mm. and so I go to the pools where I have a membership, and I do a swim and a sauna and a you know a shower and a getting ready on my own ritual there, yeah. or I'm at home and I'm doing a bit of work before the kids get up, so mm -hmm. I feel like my days. So carving time out that way, uh, I will ask for time out. If I know I've got a particularly busy week, I do schedule in time. So I say to my husband, okay, well, Thursday night, you're home and I'm home. As soon as you walk in the door, I'm going to shut the bedroom door and I'm just on my own time. Yeah. When the baby's sleeping, if I'm having a rough week, 
that's then instead of time where I would play catch up on the house or cook a dinner, that's on my own time Mm -hmm. to do whatever it is that I need to do. How do you do it? Yeah, so for me, I think it's really, first of all, letting go of any guilt that you might feel about carving out that time because sometimes I think we, we, we tell ourselves we can't do something really to protect ourselves from having those conversations that we perceive to be hard with those around us, mm. you know, about asking. Mm. Um, and also I think p- part of it may, may be subconsciously might be that mother martyrdom that, that no one else can do it the way that I do it and, yeah. that, and that it needs to be done my way. Yeah. And as long as you attach to that, then you're never going to carve out the time for yourself and you're going to continue to resent everyone else around you for not letting you. But yet sometimes it's you not letting yourself and not letting them. Totally. And I can remember that with my first and second child, I was totally that. I was even, you know, having my hate on for the grandparents that weren't helping. But at the same time, I didn't like it when they helped because they didn't feed them the right food and they didn't do it the right way and they didn't put them to sleep the way I wanted. And like this list of craziness. Yeah. But in the end I had to go, oh my God. Pack it away. Yeah. If what you need is time out to do whatever it is you need to do, work or other, mm. then let and, it be. And I think it's recognising that there's always going to be trade-offs. Like if you're going to carve out that time for yourself, then it's accepting that the people who are going to be caring for your children are going to do things their way too. Yeah. And that's not detrimental to your child. Your child will learn skills of how to ask for what they need with yes. other people. Yeah. You know, how to manage different kinds of relationships. You know, there's enormous benefits. And I think sometimes we keep really narrow focus on how we think things should be done or or whatever without seeing the gifts in dynamically shifting things up for the family you know like I I mentioned before we started recording I've just come back from a week up in Sydney studying so I've was up there for seven days intense days and my husband had the the work the childcare, the everything for that week and one of the first things said to me was wow like I really appreciate how much you do like you know, and that's the thing, you know, if you step away and somebody else now has to step in, it helps them to be more grateful for the role that you play. And even that in itself, you know, aside from the awesome part of you carving out time for you, it also starts to see other people fill that time in, fill that time in for themselves to A, build relationships with, you know, your children or whoever else it is that you need them to step in for, yeah. but then B, be grateful for the role that you play because it can be so easy to forget you know, forget, you know, we, we become complacent with our partners and what they bring to us. And same thing goes for them, you know, with us as well. Yeah. And so when you do dynamically shift things up a bit, it creates, you know, a capacity for that gratitude again. Yes. And for, the, for your children to be grateful for you too. So yeah, for me, it's, you know, getting rid of the guilt, um, looking at the benefits to those people. So, you know, perhaps, you know, if there's some resistance, identifying what those people love to do and seeing how your children might be able to fit into that or how your children might be able to accentuate that thing. We've talked about that before in other podcasts. Um, but yeah, getting up early for me, my son still naps, so I use nap time and I often work quite late into the night. Mm-hmm. And I also, I've also become more comfortable with, in my case, it's often work, working around him. You know, for a long time I wouldn't because I'd feel like, oh, it's wrong, you know, I should be playing with him. Um, but he gets to see a lot, you know, by me working and that sets a great example for him, I think. So I think it's also asking yourself, well, what can you do with your kids in tow too? You know, not, it's not, not necessarily going to be a nurturing activity, but maybe there's something else in there for you that you can still do, even if you've got the kids there, that's, you know, somewhat enjoyable for all of you. That's a bit out of routine or, yeah. So we've talked about self-care. So the idea of self-care is that you nurture and nourish the woman that you are enough that then she's got some room to flourish outwards from there. So once you've put into place small rituals for honoring and look I have certainly on the pleasure nutritionist blog got lots of blogs around this very topic so I would say go there if you want more information on those sorts of rituals but once we've put back into the woman and she's starting to feel a little bit more in touch with who she is as a woman then it's following your passions and your desires to see where you are supposed to head in this world and sometimes that's taking the plunge on learning Mm. and allowing yourself the the value the time the money and the energy spent in creating the the future that you desire so sometimes that's jumping on that course that sings to you knowing you've always had a passion to study x y or z and actually allowing yourself to do it to feel inspired to reinvent who you are right Mm, mm. 
Absolutely. And just paying close attention, I think, you know, paying attention to what lights you up, what do you find yourself constantly wanting to read about, um, you know, beyond all the kids stuff around you, how do you choose to fill your space? Are there certain books you like to read, um, certain articles that you find yourself always gravitating to on your phone, there are certain things that when you're in conversation with somebody that light you up and that you you know, become instantly extroverted about, you know, these are all little clues for what's inspiring you right now and that what might be something for you to pursue in a little bit more um, depth and with a little bit greater intention. So I love all of those sort of ways of knowing about where to go next. And, you know, as we say, certainly carve out the time to create space to think about those things and yeah. ask yourself some questions. But it is totally following your intuition, right? Because the universe is always talking to us and as is our souls through our feelings. Yes. So when we're having an emotional rush or charge or excited feeling or an inspiration or an, oh, I love that. Oh, gee, I've always wanted to do that. God, I love that. Gee, I think I'd be amazing at this. Yeah. But then we go, but, oh, I can't do that. Oh, but, oh, no, I don't have time. For, oh, but, no, I can't afford that course. It's really about um, taking that moment just to go, well, how really, what this is the support and the challenge, right? Is sometimes yeah. the challenge is there to make us jump on board all the more mm. because if it's, it is a little bit difficult for us to attain, we want to attain it that little bit harder. We pay attention more. We put more into it. We get yeah. more out of it. I don't know what when it is. When it's something that you really love and something that you're interested in enough, you'll embrace both the pain and the pleasure in pursuit of it, you know, that you'll embrace those challenges far more wholeheartedly than you will something that's lower on your, you know, values list. Yes. And I think often, even if it's not the thing that you started out doing, the course that you started studying, you become the person that you need to be through making those choices of listening to your soul's calling that then opens up the next level of where you're supposed to be. So you're never not lost, right? That's the path of the feminine is when you're following your feelings and your inspiration, you're tuning inward to see where those, those pulls like having children, where that yearning is taking you Mm. when you're paying attention to those yearnings, they're not folly. They're not useless. It's not just, uh, you know, a silly feminine feeling that is, is literally the communication pathway of your soul. It's it's the the part that lights up your physical body mm. and gives you a flag of hey over here this way. It's the mm. whisperings of follow these breadcrumbs. If you actually I love that. like Hansel and Gretel, it, it really is, isn't <laughs> it? And then if you actually have the courage, which is having really courage, comes from the word core, which is to speak one's mind from the heart, from one's heart space. Mm. If you actually have the courage, the heartfelt courage to take that leap and follow those breadcrumbs, you are always on the right path Mm. and if you've already planned it out you know where the end is and you've mapped out all the goals you're in the masculine you're not headed in the feminine the feminine is always the mystery the unknowing and the following on Mm. on the yearnings and the feelings but those but those masculine traits will also keep you on path as well so sometimes it's nice to have the mix of both yes thank you Bridget (laughs) yes you're never gonna let me get away with that one are you (laughs) (laughs) only because I know how much those things elude me and I know how much they need to happen to really solidify the creation I totally no, no, I totally totally agree with you I totally agree with you but I think to actually to have a path that is a soul's journey or who am I on the next evolution you're never going to know it in your head you're only going to know it in your heart or in your feelings in your body so that's really more not that the masculine doesn't serve us in achieving Mm. those things but if we're only listening to the head right even like my baby story right if I was only listening to my head I wouldn't have had that third child Mm. and I wouldn't be where I am now Mm. so that's just more the difference I was Yeah, yeah yeah talking about we kind of mean the same thing, just express slightly differently. <laughs> <laughs> so we hope that there's something in that for you and that you're able to um, create that space and perhaps reflect on our stories of, you know, being done with the babies and not being done with the babies and sort of resonate with where you, you fit. And finding yourself in that, Mm. in that even when you feel completely, totally, sorry, completely, totally and utterly lost, you're not because it's all serving. The fact that you've been broken down and apart and crumbled into a thousand pieces is actually where you need to be to rebuild the woman that you were. It's it's the feminine life, death, life cycle, right? Mm. We can't have life reborn, new woman, new path, new future if we're not willing to let die those pieces of us that no longer yeah. serve. And let go of the things that are no longer calling to us. Let go of the things that, you know, feel heavy and an effort and be okay with 
with saying goodbye to some of those parts of ourselves. Yeah. You know, because ultimately absolutely. our path is to grow and it's not to hold on to all of those things that we've, you know, perhaps longed to find ourselves by. Yeah. It's, it's being comfortable with only who we are now. And, you know, and yeah, just stepping into that. And so if you'd like to connect with us, you can get onto Facebook for slash nourishing the mother and for me, Bridget, suburbansandcastles.com and Julie at the Flesh and Nutritionist.com. Dot com. Yes. And same on Facebook and Instagram. And if you are enjoying any of our podcasts, please share them. Please like them. Please rate them on iTunes. That certainly helps us keep going. And like today's podcast was inspired by a question. If you have a question or something that you would really like clarity, information or a deeper delve into, we would love you to share that on Facebook in a private message in an email whatever you like so that we can actually answer what's happening in your life and we will see you next week when we continue to peel back the layers on your mothering journey this has been a production of thewellnesscouch.com check us out on Facebook and join in the conversation on facebook.com forward slash thewellnesscouch subscribe to each show on iTunes and check us out on Twitter The Wellness Couch streaming wellness into your lives Whilst the Wellness Couch presenter endeavor to provide accurate and helpful information to their listeners, these podcasts cannot take into account individual circumstances and are not intended to be a substitute for health and medical advice from a qualified health professional. You should always seek the advice of a qualified health professional before acting on any of the information provided by any of the Wellness Couch podcasts.